necessarily tough, but it'll take a little bit of a, a little bit of philosophizing, I guess you could say. But before that, I just want to say that you know it was Winston Churchill that said, if you want to know what's wrong with democracy, have a five-minute conversation with the voters. Now I don't know how we did on that tonight, Mark, but I hope that we proved Winston Churchill wrong that if you give the voters enough time to speak their minds. They actually do know about these issues, and they actually are capable of understanding these complex ideas, and they actually are capable of understanding how policy affects reality, and they have their own ideas, and they're not just a mob. They're not a mob. They're brilliant, talented individuals. But with that, I just want to go ahead and get started on these questions. The first one is, you're a libertarian. So from what I understand, that means that an individual has certain rights, and those rights need to be protected at all costs. Those are, that's the, that's the North Star. That's the primary goal of, uh, of, of living, and that's what government should be protecting. That's why we signed the uh, social contract. In the Ninth Amendment, um, it talks about uh, just because certain rights are enumerated in the Constitution should not mean that the other rights are not retained by the people. It's basically a broad amendment that was put in there um, during the sort of ratification debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, where the Anti-Federalists were saying, if you enumerate all these rights, then you're basically going to let the government get away with saying that you don't have any other rights that aren't enumerated. So they put this amendment in there for this, for, for, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, an opening, you know, for the people to secure rights that aren't you know, specifically, you have the right to free speech. You have the right to your guns. This is an amendment that says rights that are not expressly written in this Constitution. It doesn't mean that you don't have them. So my question to you is, what are some of these rights that individuals should be aware that they possess, but that aren't expressly written inside the Constitution? Because the implications would be, we could then use that Ninth Amendment to secure those rights through the Supreme Court. All rights herein not enumerated are reserved to the people of the state respectively. That's what it states. Like I said earlier, the Constitution was put together to make a, the states united, to make a, a united federal government. That, that's what it was put there. And every, this is why I, and the, the Constitution has been twisted and perverted so bad. The federal government has no right in education. It doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution that they can. It has no right in um, uh, health care. It has no right, I mean, I can go on and on, in energy, in environment. It has no right in any of those issues whatsoever. They have usurped it under the Commerce Clause. They have usurped it, and the reason it got usurped, and I, I think it's Herbert Hoover, I can't remember which president, the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot do this under the Commerce Clause. And he said, well, the Constitution doesn't say how many judges there has to be on the court. So he threatened to flood the court with judges until he got his way. That is why the Commerce Clause has been so bent out of shape. And everything the federal government does, most everything anymore, basically they say it through the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause is very simple. The Commerce Clause is to regulate, the federal government has a right to regulate commerce amongst the states. So that one state cannot charge taxes from like Colorado, oh, it's coming from Colorado, I'm gonna charge you taxes. If it's coming from California, ah, eh, you can bring it every. That's what the Commerce Clause was meant to do. Not all this other uh, usurping of powers. So that is what it, it states in there. All rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution belong to you or the state, respectively. Right, but the, the question was not what states that the federal government has or doesn't have. It's I'm specifically focused on the individual. So we have the right to free speech, we have the right to assembly, we have the right uh, to privacy. You know, what are these other rights that the founders wanted to reserve to us? You know, through the Ninth Amendment, um, you know, that, that we could sort of 
that we can sort of use or that we can sort of come to a consensus on that we have in life. So I believe personally that every human being deserves the right to not be discriminated against, right? That should be a right. Now they tried to do that in the 14th Amendment, but I think if you, if, you, know, if you use the Ninth Amendment to, and, and you use that argument that, hey, look, I have a Ninth Amendment right, that it's obvious that the majority of people believe that human beings should not be discriminated against because you don't have a choice into what, you know, did you choose to be born a man? I have no idea what that shit up. No. You probably did. Probably if you not. did, I, I that's, very we, cool. yeah. that's very cool. That's very cool if you did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you if know, I had my brothers, I'd have been born a woman, to be honest with you. No. Right. But, the, but we can't control how right. we, what, what sort of set of characteristics that we had when we were born. But when we're born into them, the government has traditionally, even post 14th Amendment, I would say in some cases, have used discrimination very, um, they have weaponized it in a stronger manner than they have probably, you know, um, you know, maybe not worse than slavery, but you, they, they've, done, they've done atrocious things with discrimination. So I would say that that's an example of one of those rights, is the right to not be discriminated against, uh, you know, in any, it doesn't matter race or gender or, or anything. So is there anything like that you, you believe that is a right that we should have, but is it necessarily normally talked about? Like, use that Ninth Amendment as sort of to be flexible in the, the rights that you're trying to secure for the American people going forward. Is there anything that, I mean, you don't necessarily have to have, but I'm, I'm just asking, yeah. you know, I'm curious about what you think as a libertarian, as someone who thinks about rights, you know, uh, a lot. If we go uh, back before the Constitution, is where all the rights come from, the individual. And before they created the Constitution, they had to come to a consensus of what our rights were. And the, the consensus they come to is we have the right to life, liberty, and they wanted to say we have the right to life, liberty, and happiness. But they argued amongst themselves and said happiness is a right. Uh, how can we have the right? So the consensus they came to was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Anything that achieves those, those are your rights. Anything to achieve those, those are your rights. If you want to smoke marijuana in the pursuit of happiness, that is your right. Provided that you do not infringe on my right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see what I'm saying? Everything is inclusive to that. Anything out of that is taken away from the basic principles. Thank you, that's actually very good. Um, the next question I have is, uh, so you said you, that you grew up in Mexico, um, so I'm pretty sure you're familiar with how things are in Mexico. And in Mexico, if, if, if you guys don't know some of the statistics, there are more murders and homicides in Mexico than there are in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's just, it's, it's, it's hell on earth in a lot of places. I know a lot of people who are there and I know why they're coming here. The real reasons of why they're coming here that don't get reported. Um, and so, I mean, this is sort of something that you don't necessarily need to do because you're running for Texas governor. But because you have a special understanding through your experience of, of the reality in that country, uh, and because it's our neighbor, is there anything that Texas could do or the United States could do to sort of try to get rid of the, the, the drug cartel problem over there or the sort of the mass homicides or the, or the killing of politicians? Because, uh, I mean, Right? Yeah. So is there anything Texas can do to sort of help Mexico with that problem? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, one thing I want to say first is um, two-thirds of all trade with the, it's NAFTA, uh, now it's the, whatever it's called, the U.S.-Mexico-Canadian Agreement. I'm surprised it's not called the Trump Agreement, but anyway. Um, goes through Texas. Two thirds of that goes through Texas. Texas deals with a lot of international trade, more than California, Arizona, New Mexico, all of them combined. It goes through Texas. Now, 
my explanation of the, the cartel problems and all that, I'm sure that a lot of people are not going to like me for it. I remember in Mexico where you would go out and play in the village square at night. You can't do that anymore. There's shootings, there's cartels fighting over territory, uh, gang wars, children being killed, uh, children being uh, taken into the cartels. Uh, so mothers, what do they do? They send their children over here uh, and, and uh, you know, sometimes put them on, like Moses, put them on a little boat, shove them across the river and, and say a prayer and God take care of them. And a lot of people over here uh, tell me, it says, how can somebody be so callous to do that to their own child? Don't they know it's illegal to come here? Now, the thing is, guys, we're to blame. We're to blame for the cartel wars. We're to blame the bloods on our hands of all those children, of all those gang wars. Why? Because we consume their product. It's about cocaine. It's about heroin. It's about marijuana. If we didn't consume it, those problems wouldn't exist. We try to stick our head in the sand and say, why does Mexico have all these problems? Why, and, and I'm not just blaming us, okay? But why is there so much corruption? Why is it possible for the drug cartels to dominate the country? Let me pose it this way. Why is it possible for the big insurance companies to dominate our politics? It's money. Why do the big businesses control our legislatures? Money. When it comes right down to it, and we, we may not like the answers, but if we did not consume their drugs, they would have no way to exist. They wouldn't exist. I remember when they didn't exist. So, uh, and, and, and I, I realize it, it, it's a bad situation. One of my favorite uh, hometowns was Ciudad Juarez. And it got to the point where there was more people being killed there than Iraq, Afghanistan, and all that combined. All because of drugs. All right, Mark. Well, I don't want to end on that note. Uh, so I have <laughs> one more question. Yeah, no, uh, please. It's, it's, no. uh, right. So... I'm a historian, you know, I like the classics, the Greeks, the Romans, all the way up and through, you know, today, um, all across the world. So I want to ask you, who's your favorite historical figure and why? It could be a president, it could be somebody, I mean, whoever you want. There's, uh, you know, s several people uh, come to mind, and, and it's not necessarily because of something major that they did over a long period of time. It, it, it could be in, in, in just one instance at the right time, at the right place at the right time. Um, I mean, obviously, we have the classics of, uh, you know, Washington being at the right place at the right time. I mean, uh, Abraham Lincoln's a little bit more controversial, but, you know, he was at the right place at the right time. He ran, I can't remember how many, campaigns, never ever won or held office once. The only campaign he won was the President of the United States. But he was at the right place at the right time. Martin Luther King was at the right place at the right time. Uh, Benito Juarez, when he said, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. It was something that the whole world needed to hear. The respect for the rights of others is peace. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, Gandhi was at the right place at the right time. And let's come forward a little bit more, and, let, and let's say Vicente Fox. A lot of people go, whoa, that cowboy lunatic. No, he stopped a 80-year domination of a party that iron-fistedly controlled Mexico. Uh, you know, he, <laughs> he, he was a character, all right, but he stopped it. And it, it totally put a different spin on things. 
so so there's there's a lot of people that and I think it's more than anything it's just timing that their mindset and, and timing was just right um, and uh, I probably shouldn't say this but I'm gonna anyway uh, <laughs> I remember the first time and I didn't vote for him and I totally disagree with his politics and uh, but I, I respect the man I remember the first time I heard Barack Obama speak he wasn't even a senator. And I yelled at my wife and I said, come here, come here, you gotta see this, you gotta see one of the next presidents of the United States. Because he was just that, he could dominate the mic like nobody. Like I said, I totally disagree with his politics, but I think he, he believed what he was doing was right. What, you know, you got, I can respect that. I don't have to admire it or anything, but I can respect that. So that there's there's a lot of people that uh, you know, especially if, that I admire that have influenced me. But to pinpoint just one particular one, Zeus? No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that any particular one. Well, that's good, man. Those it's great answers all the way through, Mark. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank everybody for showing up. I mean, Thanks, everyone. Home. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. So I appreciate it. A little bit more pizza out there, so uh, if you wanted to refill up the gas tank.